Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another NerdTube Highly Illogical Podcast. I'm Cousin Cheeto, and I am joined by my normal compatriots in arms, Majo Rage and uh, Jefferson Kelly from a Trip Beyond Trek Podcast. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Good, nice good. Here. Doing and good. Thanks have, for having us. Hey, no problem. And we have a special guest here this week, Mr. Ad, or Alec Peters from the Axonar films. Uh, the, he has uh, the uh, he has he did the widely successful uh, Prelude to Axonar, which came out a couple years ago, and he's been working hard to bring out the full length feature of of Axonar in the near future. Um, so, you know, uh, so you know, just kind of starting off here. Um, and I'll correct you to start. We're not making a feature film. That was I'm one sorry. Of the- that was one of the things that uh, we, we agreed not to do uh, when we settled with CBS. Um, they didn't want a f- full-length feature. Uh, uh, that is so that is true. Yeah, about so that. We're making two more 15-minute episodes, which is what the guidelines allow. Um, um, so, yeah, so that's what we're doing. Gotcha. And you know, that's fine. That's I, I'm sorry. Um, I, I did. I didn't know that from the guidelines. I, I did some research on the I, I'm not super familiar with the guidelines. Um, but when I, but you know, when, when we, we decided to to have you on for the interview, when, you know, when we discussed it, I'm like, well, I don't know a lot about the guidelines for fan films, but I'm like, I should probably, you know, look it up and, and research it. Um, so I'm going to start off with the question. And since we, since we're, I'm going to segue right into it with uh, my first question is, so with, with the guidelines and you, and you having to, you know, kind of tweak and, and, and change everything up. How hard was it to go from your original vision of of the Axonar project to what what it has become now, which will have to be what you said? And as I said, I'm not saying it's going to be bad. I'm just saying like sure, it's what, different. Yeah, but it's different. So, yeah. what are your what like what what is your pers- perspective on you know the differences and changes, any tweaks that you've had to do that you you thought you that kind of came out of nowhere, stuff like that. Yeah, well, um, it was it was real. It was actually when we got limited. I don't and I don't remember. That was you know 2017 when we f- followed the settlement agreement. Um, stop sneezing in my face, dude. Uh, it's one of our foster. This is what this is a uh, Juno, one of our foster kitties, because um, we do cat rescue. Oh, um, wow. So uh, when when we agreed to do that, I. It took a month or so, and I was like, okay, so we're just going to take the script, and I'll just make two more episodes just like Prelude to Axanar. That was the, you know, that was the easiest way to get to, to, to 30 minutes, right? From a two-hour script to a 30-minute script. You just reformat it. You pull out all the character stuff, I hate to say, and you tell the story. Um, and it was... Uh, that was I, I just felt that was the way we were going to get the 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 donors the big the the most bang for the buck. The donors wanted um, you know they they want they they had paid to see this story, um, and I wanted to tell the story. And now what's interesting at the time, Rob Robert Burnett was still directing, and he wanted to make the first thirty minutes of the feature film. I was like. Well, what the hell does that accomplish? And he wanted his only goal was to bolster his resume. So he thought, well, we'll show what we could have done. I was like, well, that doesn't give the donors any satisfaction. And so I so I did a poll on the Action R fan group. And um and it was something like 700 to 20 or something ridiculous. In you know, the I was like, okay, fans have spoken. That's what we're doing. And uh, uh, at which that's when Rob quit. And um, so, uh, I, you know, it was pretty easy. And it, it took me all of a week to re- rewrite the script. Now it's gone through several iterations since then. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's how that's that's kind of how we got to, to it. And I'm entirely... I'm entirely satisfied with 
what we're doing, that we're making two more episodes. Like Because Prelude has been the bar, right? Not just for us. I, I would... I humbly submit that it's the bar for Star Trek fan films. And, um, and so we've been like, you know, one of our focus has been, it's gotta be at least as good. Like if it's as good as prelude, I'll be okay. I kind of want it to be better. Right. You know, you always want to improve. And um, there are certain things we've done to make it better, but I, I think at the end of the day, I'll be real happy with, especially now that, you know, we've got 16 out of the 18 actors in the can. We've got two assemblies already set up. No visual effects or no vis or compositing. But, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, we've got some great actors, um, some actors that will really – there's a couple that – a couple that you don't know, you've never heard of, that will really impress you. Um, a couple that you do know, you go, holy sh – you know um, – so I think it's going to be a good experience. I've got a um, question for you, if, if I could. You were you're talking about the donors. Has there has there been any difficulty? Has it been easy? Has it been uh, hard to kind of keep them patient, keep them uh, assured that it's going to happen over the last ten years? Have you have you had any issues with the donors specifically? Oh yeah. Well, um, I think. <laughs> I think the cat I, wants to be part of it. That's what cats do. That's cat. I know. Like. That's good. I think um, we have been um, really good about keeping everyone updated. I, I mean, between an email, our email updates, and our updates on the Kickstarter and the Indiegogo, where we raised most of the money, um, our video updates, um, and uh, it, it, you know, just and our website. I mean, we. When people, you know, especially donors who say, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, well, that's your <laughs> fracking fault because we're pushing out lots of information. Um, if you choose not, and if you choose not to pay attention to it, that's fine. That's your choice. But don't come back at me and say, I don't know what's going on. But that's your fault, <laughs> right? So, um, however, most um you know, I, I think there's basically three camps. There's like, I would say the vast majority of, of donors are like, yeah, we know there's challenges and we know it's taking time, but can't wait to see when, when it comes out. That's the vast majority of them. Um, there's another group that's, that's, you know, a very, very small group of our 10,000 donors. And there's, you know, there's, couple hundred that are like pissed off and you know haven't paid attention and you know we're like well you know you got sued and blah 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 well that's not my fault you you, you wanted you wanted you know studio quality star trek this is this is how you know this is what happened so there's a very small number that are that kind of upset and then there's another group that's you know like whatever if it comes out great if not whatever um, but I think for the most part, it, it, and I just sent out, it's funny, I just sent out an email and told everyone, um, since I'm no longer, we basically had a spinoff Aries Studios, so Axonar has nothing to do with it. And uh, so Crystal and I have nothing to do with it. And, and it's just because CBS has just been harassing the studio. And, um, and I just had to send an email and say, okay, here's my email. It's alec at axnor.com. Don't email me at Aries Studios anymore. I'm trying to get rid of that email. And um, and a lot of people just email me like, oh, okay, thanks, you know, donors. You know, one one really nice lady from the UK, who's, she's like, like, I've lost track and I'm blah, blah, blah. I never got my patches. So, you know, I'm shipping her a, a, a package tomorrow with like 20 patches in it even though she probably got like two in the, in the Kickstarter, I'm just sending her 20 and saying, here, here you go. Sorry. Sorry. You never got your patches. Um, and then other people, I've gotten a bunch of messages like, Oh, I'm, we're behind you. Keep going. Can't wait to see it, you know, this year. And um, so, yeah, there's a wide variety. I, you know, it's really interesting. You, you, you find out, I, I think the response to us 
is more an indication of people than it is like I don't take anything personally. But it's interesting. Like I have people like that who are like, man, I know it's been 10 years, but man, we're excited that you're on the one yard line and we can't wait to see it. And then you have people who are like, it's taken 10 years. What have you been doing? You haven't done anything, blah, blah, blah. You know, and you're like, okay. That says more about those the individuals than it does about us. I mean, there's two different ways you can view this. And I guess it kind of tells you something about a person's outlook on the world. I'd like to think that most people are, you know, doing their best and, and working hard. And, and uh, heck, I've given money to projects that, I mean, I, I gave money to Captain Pike, which came out, which was, I think they fundraised in, 2015 right after we did and i knew todd the guy who was running it and he got he got ray uh oh what's his name ray uh i want to say ray lewis that's not it um he got a, a two well-known actors eric three eric roberts was walter koenig and um i think forget the other guy uh he he was uh he was the bad senator in rising sun um anyway great actors and he filmed and has done nothing with it and hasn't finished the project and i'm always like todd give me the film i'll finish that for you you know um but whatever i, I and i gave him money in the kickstarter i'm not bitter i'm not yeah yeah you know that's kickstarter sometimes things work out and sometimes things don't so i want to be the you know whether the project is successful or not i want to be positive to the creators uh, I had to wait like four years for a set of headphones that I ordered. You know, I wasn't bitter at them. I was just like, hey, guys, when's it coming out? Oh, okay. I even sent an email to, to them. was like, look, I know you sent out a gazillion emails. Don't make me go through them all. When are the headsets coming out? I'm in no rush. And so I think, you know, it's a reflection of, of people, how people react to different things. Are you the person who gets upset at the restaurant when they bring the wrong food or you, you're – your steak is overcooked or undercooked or, or are you the person that says, Hey, this isn't what I ordered. You know, well, it's, it's a reflection of you, not the steak. Right. That's kind of my attitude. Okay. Uh, before uh, Mage, if you have any questions, you can jump in here in a second. I'm just going to run through the quick comments here. Uh, we have Arden Rowan. Uh, he just says, uh, your story was wonderful. Sorry. You were used like a green chick. I'm guessing an Orion. <laughs> it's got to be an Orion. Yeah. Uh, could be a Gorn, but I mean, if you're into that kind of reptilian thing, I guess. Uh, no. Dale Simpson says, uh, hey, brother. Zan Dale says, is, yeah, Dale's my good friend. He's uh, uh, he is the director of uh, security at Airy Studios and uh, always just, just the super nicest guy. Uh, gotcha. So, yeah. Uh, Zam, uh, Zam from here from NerdTube, Zam says, Morning, guys. Uh, Jen's con, con, Knudsen, Knudsen, uh, the KSI, okay. the KSI, like knife, Knudsen. yeah, like the knife. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> uh, it says, Greetings, Jim Landscape says, Hello. Um, and then just a cut, you know, a couple other messages from Zam saying hello. And then we are back to Jim who says, Hail Cheeto, M Meg, which I'm guessing is Mage, Big J, and Zam. <laughs> um okay uh mage did you have any questions to start off um i was interested by and curious about your decision to use a documentary as your framing device for prelude to axonar i found it very interesting creatively like stylistically but i think you i i have a theory but I want to hear what you your decision making process was, but just say that I felt like it gave it a great blend of action, but in character moments. Yeah. So the whole re I was just explaining this to an actor yesterday. Um, basically, we wanted to come out with a proof of concept, right? Because we wanted to make the two hour movie, this the story that I had written, and so. We we're like, well, we need to prove that we can do it. And Renegades had just the Renegades had done a brilliant job of that. Because if you remember back in 2013, 
Renegades came out with this video, this this kind of trailer, teaser trailer, with Walter Koenig and as as Admiral Chekhov and Tim Russ as you know Cap Captain Tuvok or Com Commodore or whatever he was, and they just did it. They put him in uniform, makeup, and green screen. And I was like, holy shit. That that was like opened my eyes. And I was like, well, how do we do something like that? Right? How do we do something that's proof of concept without building sets? All right. Um, because building sets is the, the, that's what you, and I and and fortunately Sky Conway was gracious enough to invite me on as a as a producer uh for uh, for renegades and um uh, I got to where I got to meet a lot of people and really learn a lot about fan films. I had been on Star Trek New Voyages for a while, but um, Renegades was a step up and 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 very you know. So I was like, well, how long have you had the studio and blah blah blah. I got to really get into it. So and so that's thanks to Sky and Frank Zanka was the uh, line producer who was who was really sharp. Um, and uh, I remember at one point Frank needed some something. They need like zip ties or something. And I said, dude, I'll do it. He says, oh, I'll find someone else. I said, no, dude, that's why I'm here. So, you know, he gave me some cash and I ran out to the Dollar General and bought some zip ties. Um, so I learned a lot on that set. But that was the key was do a teaser trailer that doesn't take sets. Right. And so I'm like, OK, how are we going to do this? And the inspiration was the MASH episode called The Interview, which was done in black and white and it was basically this newsreel crew that was interviewing uh the mash 4077 and it was done like it was real serious right so they were all you know in character the way it wasn't a lot of comedy and so i said okay yeah kind of that like that that's kind of what we need to do so i kind of and i i pitched it to the got the the director at the time and he loved the idea, and I wrote out the script, um, and then he he added bits to it as well, and um, but that was that that was kind of it. It was basically an it was economic. We're like, you know, and in my first naive delirium of of a budget, I was like, we could probably do this for twenty grand. I thought Prelude could be done for twenty grand. I was like, yeah, it'll be like five grand for the actors and five grand for makeup and five grand for a studio. So I thought like 20 grand. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask for 10 grand. And I said, if I get 10 grand, I'll come up with the other 10 grand and we'll shoot it. Well, we raised 101 off this, this, and, and we did it. You know, the ask, ASK, ask video for, for Prelude was done in my apartment with Richard Hatch, uh, 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 Ryan Husk, if you know Ryan, who is one of our producers, um, myself, Mark Edward Lewis, who's been with me um, forever, and um, and it and it came out. The ask video came out great, and then so you know, and I've been working on Axnar and releasing. We had vi we had VFX uh, some VFX shots done, and we had even, so I released it, and we made one hundred and one thousand um, dollars, and thank God because we spent one hundred and twenty five. Uh, and, but that was including the premiere and everything. Um, but, you know, having that money allowed us to really do things the right way. We had an Academy Award winning makeup artist, right? And, uh, I mean, the makeup budget wound up being like 13, five, if I remember correctly. Um, so the format allowed us to be economical and to spend money where you saw it the most, right? Actors, costuming, um, you know, it, it was all done in a great studio with great a great crew and everything, you know. Um, so uh, there you go. That's the answer to your question. It was an economic move. And again, thanks to Renegades. I mean, Renegades really trailblazed a lot. They, they did a great, a great job that way. Um, um. So one one of my one of my questions was going to be um, 
if so in the XNR film, I know that the 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 four years war takes place right around the 2250s, correct? I 2240s, 2240s, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, okay. 2041 to 2245, I think. Okay. Uh yeah. So I don't I know that this wouldn't make too much sense, but I was gonna ask you if like if there was any Trek character that you could get with the original actor. And, uh, you know, you know, I, I know we're not talking about actors that are in it, but, I, you know, and, and with the 2250s and 40s, it's like, OK, a lot of characters from TOS would probably be a bit too young. I mean, you might have a young Kirk in there. Yeah. So even if it's kind of irrational, like, let, but let's just kind of fanfic here. Uh, so, yes. So uh, he, I'll tell you the, the part um, that when you read the full script, when we finally get that out and to all the donors and all and you read the full script to the full feature film at the end at the Kittimer peace conference, Kirk and Gary Mitchell make an appearance and it's, and, um, and it's basically, you see this scene and it's, and Garth and Karn are talking and um, Kirk and Gary Mitchell are hiding around the corner and, Kirk was, says something like, oh, my God, that's Car that's Karn or that's Garth and Karn, whatever. And Gary's like, let's get out of here. We're going to get in trouble. And that was because we know that Kirk was a, a new-fledged cadet on the Axonar Peace mission. So that's how you work it. At, that's how I worked it in. And it's very important um, for me for the Axonar script, and it's something I think people took to, that we really honor the canon, right? This is not discovery. This is not some retrofitted nonsense. Um, and it's and it's not meant to be an alternate timeline, although it's technically the an Axonar universe story, right? But it's meant to fit in. And um, so having things that fit in are, is was really important to me. There are some things you ignore because A lot of the production design of the cage, which was 20, the cage is like 22, uh, late 20. It was like 2252 yeah. or yeah. three. I, I was, yeah, somewhere in it. It's in the Detroit, right? Yep. It was about 10 I, years I before, I think, TOS. It was like 10 years I, before was, TOS or something. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was seven. Well, didn't Spock say it was 17 years? Oh, it might have been 70, yeah. Menagerie, in Menagerie. Anyway. I believe me, I plotted out the timeline and everything. But the one thing you couldn't reconcile was um, the production design of the cage. Because the difference between the cage, which was 64 mm -hmm. and, and right, and, and Man Trap, which came out in 60, it was produced in 65, I believe. Yeah, it came out in 66. It came out in 66. Um, the difference in styles is the difference between 50 sci-fi and 60 sci-fi. Yeah. And I actually had um, Darren Doctorman, who many of you may know, did a, uh, he did like a quick sketch of what the bridge should look like. Now, remember, we're going 10 years before the cage, roughly, right? Um and that we also were like, that means this is kind of like something that would have been produced in the forties, right? If the cage was, if, if, you know, if the cage was produced, looks like it was produced in the fifties, you, you've got to go back. Now you're getting into like Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon territory. And, and Darren Docterman did a, 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 a quick sketch of the bridge and it had like round view screens and stuff. And, and it was, I saw exactly where it was going. It made a lot of sense, but it was, we made a choice and the choice in production design we made was we want it to look like Star Trek. We want it to look like TOS, but different, not necessarily flashier or anything, but you knew it was TOS roughly. And so that's why we came up with a different <laughs> color scheme, which was darker because we wanted to be, this is a warship really. You know, the Ares class was a warship. So it's a little more submarine-like. And um, so we used more blues and blue grays. And and um, that's what, and we went with 
touch screens for the panels, right? Now, here we are sitting in, you know, we're sitting in 20 in in, in the 21st century um and heck you can look at minority report which was what 15 years at least 15 years ago yeah now right that was in the aughts somewhere in the aughts and they're already doing the holographic screens which then right so if they're doing the holographic screens in minority report you're looking at picard doing them and you i'm kind of going okay seen it already right um not impressed if they're that's like 300 year old technology at that point right if, if realistically if we're realistic about where star trek should be no one's pressing any buttons everyone's got a little chip in their head and it's communicating through thought with and right realistically i mean look at how far we keep progressing as you know our vision of the future so you gotta discount all of that and say we're not Right, we're not really trying to play that game because Star Trek is the future, but it's not our future, right? And this is the big, the big uh, thing I'll I'll take issue with with Akiva Goldsman is um, he keeps moving the timeline. And he's like, well, things have changed, so we got to change, and we got to make the Romulans have been messing with the timeline. So first of all. Okay, so we all agree it is not the original timeline. You just said so, Akiva. Um, second of all, I don't necessarily agree with that because Akiva is working on the assumption that Star Trek is our future. No, it's not our future. It's a future. It was the future of the 1960s, you know, um, and and Gary Seven and all that stuff. And we know in the the eugenics wars happened in the 1990s. And, and you know, and we had it was thought we'd have flying cars by now. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So so we just said, okay, we're gonna play in the future of that Star Trek is, and we're just gonna make some changes. And the it was important for us to make um you know, touch screens. I'm like, okay, touch screens, no one's using toggle switches. 300 years from now, right? No one's using little jelly beans. I mean, let's use touch. And that was kind of like our big, the big change we made to the bridge. Um, and, and that was our, uh, that was our nod to where we thought we, at least we needed to go to be a little more realistic. Now look at where, you know, look at where strange new worlds is. And they do a nice job with the homage with the jelly bean button panel off on the side, but basically it's all touchscreen, right? Um, they and and so uh, yeah, and uh, um, and even in Picard season three, they got rid of the holograms. No one's flying a ship with holograms in Picard season three. Why? Because they realized maybe that wasn't the best thing to do cinema, cinematographically, cinematographically. Yeah, so I mean, does that your question. My question, yes, I you yeah you you answered my question with the Kirk thing, but yeah, <laughs> I I think that one of the difficulties that some of the I think the fans may not re be able to reconcile or to accept is that we we can't we can't have something that's uh, produced today that's going to look like the '60s. Yeah, that's the thing. So, what is the expectation that the fans have? Are you expecting that any Star Trek that takes place in the 2260s is going to be these kind of sets, the jelly bean buttons, the this, that? Is that really what you want to see? This is, you know, this is the 20s, the 2020s. You really want to see Star Trek that takes place in that time that's truly faithful to the 60s? A, sm a small bridge, you know, the different buttons. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is that? Why would that make you happy? And, and this doesn't, that's the thing I just, I never quite understood is, is that, and, uh, and they, they want to have all these explanations as to, well, why does, why does the, why does enterprise the NX-01 look like it could be more advanced than the, uh, uh enterprise NCC 1701 as it was in the sixties. It's like, okay, well, that's easy because enterprise was done in the mid two thousands is when it was filmed. And that's just, that's just what they used. And I don't know about you guys, but it does kind of, 
it, it tends to be frustrating that there always has to be some some kind of in-universe explanation for modernizing sets and cinematography. I, you know, my, here's my take on that. Um, I didn't have a problem with with Enterprise at all, right? Um, for what you do, for kind of like what you just said, right? You know, it's like, did it look like a, a you know, a ship that was launched in the 2150s or whenever the NX-01 was launched? Did it look like a ship was launched? I was like, yeah, that, I thought it was great, right? I mean, the Akira Prize look didn't really, I was like, I was, that's not really original, but whatever. I was like, okay, I'm in. Um, and uh, and the, the challenge is when you do what they did in Discovery. And there are those of us who are purists in one form or another that just were like, okay, it's you're changing so much. Don't try and tell us it's part of the prime timeline. Just tell us it's an alternate timeline. Because that's what J.J. did, right? In, in, in 2009, he said alternate timeline. And I'm like, good, I'm in. I get it. Different Kirk. Diff everything's different. Kirk didn't have a father. I get it. He, so he became an asshole. All right. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 bigger enterprise, whatever. It's built on land in Iowa, <laughs> whatever. Right. You could just say it's alternate timeline. Do whatever the hell you want. Not going to affect my prime timeline. Um, and that's what I think they should have done with Discovery because they were so busy shoehorning shit in. It just about the, the only production design decision, the one and only decent production design decision they did, they made in Discovery was the phasers. I was like, OK, that was cool. You had the little three nozzles on the front of the phasers. That was like someone paying attention. I was like, I, I get it. That was cool. But everything else, the Klingons looked awful. The ships were ridiculous. The costumes were the rejects of the costumes from, from Star Trek, the motion picture. The, 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 the discovery is the reject of the, the, the uh, Ralph McQuarrie enterprise that Roddenberry said, nah, not, we're not going with that. Uh, there were so many bad decisions. And then they were trying to shoehorn all these different things in. I'm like, just say it's the discovery verse. I'm cool with that. Then you can do whatever you want. Call it Star Trek. I don't care, but it's it's not the prime timeline, and that was my biggest issue with that. Um, and and that was le like I think you're talking Jefferson more about like what they did in Star Trek: Strange New Worlds. All right, like mm -hmm. I have a easier time. Like if you said okay, Star Trek: Strange New Worlds is prime timeline, I'm like, I'll give you that. To your point. We're going to modernize. It's 60 years later. We're going to have a different... It's not going to look like the 60s Star Trek. All right. Uh, and I hate the bridge, but okay, I'll give it to you all. I. It doesn't... Strange New Worlds does not... You can tell me it's prime timeline, and I'm like, fine. I got it. It works. Those people are really trying to work it in um, outside of the, the whole time shifting thing. But... <laughs> I'm, you know, so I, I see what you're saying, and that's kind of what Strange New Worlds is is done, right? It's kind of said we're in the prime, you know, we're in prime timeline, but we're gonna we're not we're not gonna pay attention to what went before. There okay. shouldn't be a problem with modernizing, in my opinion. I, modernizing I doesn't. Job. Yeah, modernizing so. doesn't mean that you're in an alternate universe. Yeah, I yeah. I 100 agree with you, Jefferson. Yeah, I agree. Is, is you know and as i said as long as they pay homage to the which they do i mean for me in strange new worlds they pay homage to yes. the original 60s set but they're just not being like you know they're they're they're, they're actually modernizing <laughs> and i'm okay with that i i don't i'm not one who sit there and says oh that doesn't look like the 60s bridge it must be an alternate timeline oh no like no yeah. i don't do that like uh, it's a tv show and it is, and it is a TV show we love, and we should love it for more than just the aesthetic of the bridge is not the same. You know, it is the yeah. same. I love Strange New Worlds. I, I, it's, it's possibly my second favorite Star Trek show after mm -hmm. Deep Space, after Deep Space Nine, of course. 
Um, it's I'm amazing. Gonna, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. It is really it is. Absolutely. I'm going to run through a couple comments here. I'm not going to get all, all of them. We've got a bunch coming in. Uh, but we got a, a tabletop tangent. We got Donna Parker saying hello. Um, we've got, and I'm not going to bring all these comments up. Uh, I, can you, did you know this name? I don't, I can't, can't, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> and he oh, says, oh, Constantinos uh, Aron, uh, Arvinitakis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm great. Um, I recognize a good Greek name. Yeah. Right. Oh, we, we have our own Greek on this channel. His name's Ginger Greek. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, tabletop tangent who is i believe tyler from the avalon universe I and i do have tyler. a What's yeah say, i do tyler? i do have i do want to talk a little about the avalon universe here in a little bit uh it says minority reports 22 years ago wow. Frank parker <laughs> jr i know i know it's it's a lot uh jen said uh nudson says yes but the flat panels were the same layout as tos so it works pretty seamlessly which you know uh our infamous troll rick b says hello Josh said, not not Josh from Avalon, Josh Ellis says, uh, just like Peter Jackson's The Lord, of, I'm guessing that's The Lord of the Rings. The goal is to capture the spirit of the original canon and tell what if story about pre-Kirk Enterprise, period. If you're excited about all that, uh, you'll you'll be in. Yep. And I mean, as I said, it, you, you can't be too nitpicky about it. It's, it's, it's you know, science fiction. Yeah. Um, Rick B. also says Enterprise is great. Uh, Enterprise is great. I just, for me, I think Enterprise was my second favorite Star Trek, uh, second oh. to um, DS9. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. I loved Enterprise? it. I, yeah, Enterprise. Yeah. I loved it. I love the aesthetic of it. I love the fact that they, I love that, you know, they, that they did make it like more of a submarine type ship. It, it was raw. Um, I, I'm not saying it was the a great show. I just enjoyed it a lot because I love that pre-Federation feel where it's like, yeah, we are humans and we are out here and it, everything is not comfy cozy and we are our backs are against the wall a lot of the times. Yeah. So no, I, 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 I the thing about Enterprise is it it wears well. I mean, it's 25 years, right? Isn't it 25 years since that show's been off the air? Uh, and, 2005 uh, or 2006 is when it went off the air. So, so yeah, it's, just it's shy going on 20 years. Yeah, 20, going on 20 years. 20 and and it holds up really well. It, it's it's I think it's you know a show that people are going back to and going, oh yeah this this show works. Um, it got you, good when it was too late. Yes, in my opinion, you are yeah. you are one hundred percent correct on that. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, so we brought up the unless Mage, do you have a question before I jump into my next one? I think that you're about to go where I was planning on going, so I'll let you do it, Mr. Host of the Year. <laughs> uh, I, was, I knew you were waiting on that. Um, so, um, so you know, working, you know, working with the Avalon Universe. I know you've worked with Josh and 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 Tyler a bit doing projects. Uh, you know, we are big fans here of the Avalon Universe. I mean, we we've, we've done premieres with them, interviews with them you know, for their fan films. Uh, we, we love most of, of what they've put out um, because they have, they kind of have that same mindset as you is, you know, they, they, they love Trek and they are trying to honor that love by making good Trek. And right. so, you know, what, what, how did that relationship between you and Josh and all that come about? Like, I mean, you know, I, a good question. Um, it came about because um, I mean, I guess I I guess and Josh can correct me here. Um, I'm pretty sure I met Josh because of Interlude, which Jonathan Lane produced, um, and he produced obviously used our sets at, at our studio. So um, and on on Interlude I was just an actor, um, and uh, but Josh was shooting it, and um, I think I think Interlude was a Interlude was an interesting, was interesting in that you had Jonathan Lane, who was up until that time just blogging about fan films, right? Uh, he was executive producing it and had written it, and then you do you were doing it at our studio with our sets in our universe with Garth. And then you had Josh who was DPing it and Victoria who was directing it, and listen. 
I, I'm, and I'm sure I speak with, uh, as a matter of fact, I should tell, um, I, I should send this to Jonathan um, so he can uh, comment on it. Um, there he is. I just, I just sent it, and I'll send it to Josh as well. Um, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, I don't want to necessarily say acrimony, but there was a lot of, of um, friction on the set. Um, and a lot of it was between Josh and Victoria, which led to them breaking their relationship. And, um, and I, so I didn't really know Josh that well at that, at that point. And I was obviously working with Victoria on Garth and, um, uh, so I got to spend some time with Victoria and the, I mean, the good news is I think it's a really worthy fan film and it, it's certainly something that I'm proud to have in the action art universe. Um, I, I'll, I'll point out that action art is the only fan film to have two different fan films made about it. Um, and, and, you know, we have prelude to acts. We are the, the animated puppet parody and we have interlude. And we're about to have like three more this year. Um, so we're re real excited about that. Um, I think the action or universe is going, going to live on. Um, well, actually, there may be four more this year. We'll see how things things go. Um, so that, But that's kind of where I started to work with Josh. And um, the more I time is spent with Josh, the more I liked him. And, and I think he's gotten, I mean, Josh is, he came and did our Jewish space laser um, trailer for us and did a magnificent job. Magnificent. Um, so the more I've worked with Josh, the more I like him and the more company he keeps getting, he keeps getting better and better. I mean, there were, sh I mean, there are shots on, on Avalon projects and I, I just take screenshots and I've sent them off to Jeff Mindy B and said, Holy shit, this is fuck. I'm um, sorry. This is fracking good. And um, yeah, and and Josh, so Josh and I have become really good friends, and I think we um, uh, we become closer <laughs> the past few months as the haters have started hating on him. Uh, I think I don't think the hate the Axonar haters don't have enough uh, uh, enough fuel. They have to hate on other people, so they've started hating on people I associate with. So now they're hating on Josh. So I've been giving him coaching on how to ignore the haters. <laughs> oh man, don't, man! If 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 they're coming after Josh, man, they, they better watch out because I I'll take them out. I mean, yeah. I'll jump through the monitor at him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know it's I, I know it, it's even it's, I got a little bit yeah. of grief. Oh God, oh Jefferson, they, that's right. They got on your case too. Yeah, oh, literally, on. like they're just they're they're reaching. Let's let's see. Yeah. Who all we can we can grab onto? It's like, come on, guys, yeah, really? There's, but and somebody said again today. It's like, don't they realize we're talking about Star Trek, right? Right? It's like you realize what you're doing goes against everything that Star Trek is about. Mm, yep. Right? You know, it's like if Gene Roddenberry was alive, he would be calling you guys out and saying, "Get the." blank out of my fandom um so uh there you go um hi <laughs> jens jens nudson <laughs> they uh says uh, uh in his comment jens nudson's comment alec tell them about the sex toys and warhammer <laughs> so they got, are those one in the same because i mean warhammer and sex i mean <laughs> yeah well we're, we're joking about um we're joking about it because one of the you know one of the haters said uh, was looking at our at my bank statements from Axstar Productions back at, you know when we were in L.A. It's like he's spending money on sex toys and Warhammer, and I'm like, well Warhammer, yeah I spent a ridiculous amount of money on Warhammer, uh, and, and so I, I said, but Warhammer and sex toys, how do you come up with that? And one of our fans. Uh, who was watching the live stream, just hysterical, says, 
Sex Toys and Warhammer. That's my jam. <laughs> so, hey. So it's become like a running joke. Like you know, I, hey. I it's... got over the sushi and, and tires thing from years ago. <laughs> you're spending money on sushi and tires. Now they're, I, I guess they've evolved to it's Warhammer and Sex Toys. Um, I, I mean, their whole running commentary is that I took donor money and spent it on things other than the production, right? Which, of course, is false. Um, and I've given them the proof, but they don't want to listen. They just no, I, they they won't. Once they've made up their mind and they've dug yeah. their feet in the ground, they 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 will find anything to. They will. I've come to find that they they will find it rather than being like, okay, fair game, you proved it, whatever. They they will just dig their head their heads in the sand and they will just keep on going. So, yeah, I, 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 I've minds, experienced that in the past. There are people whose minds that you're never going to change. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. they're always going to be. The election, was stolen. the election was stolen. There's nothing, there's yeah. no number of cases win that the other side wins that'll convince you that the election wasn't stolen. There was there was one uh this one phrase I saw that was that was in your defense, Alec. Uh in, in your defense, uh was it was a jab at the haters of that Alec could walk on water and then be accused of not knowing how to swim. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <I've> <laughs> that's exa exactly it. Exac yeah, that's exactly. Exactly. So you have to, you know, I, I'm really considering doing YouTube videos about haters, about how to handle haters, because I, I finally, it took me years, but I got to the point where I'm just like, you people are bozos. I There's nothing redeeming about your life, which is why you're hating on me. But there's nothing, you know, it's not like Steven Spielberg and you know, and Brian Singer and J.J. Abrams were like, hey, Alec, you know, this is why your films suck. In which case I'd go, oh, OK, I better listen to these guys. Right. Th these guys are heavyweights. It's like I, I always joke. The joke, the running joke with Josh is like they all work at Walmart and think they're filmmakers. Right. You know, <laughs> 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 not that there's anything wrong with working at Walmart. But sure. you're not Martin Scorsese, does, Scorsese doesn't work at Walmart, though, right? You know, <laughs> if Martin Scorsese wants to tell me that my film sucks, I'm going to listen to Martin, to Marty. Um, but uh, yeah, what I, I think we all want to tell those people is start putting pen to paper. Okay, write your own where's, script. Where's come your, up with, yeah. come up with your thing that you think is is the winner and do it. Uh, and it's just there's there are no doers there. So the, no, those. It's, it's, listen, what did you do to, today? You sent me your, you know, your, your pricey, your, 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 uh, um, I, yeah, I sent you a premise for a, a fan film series I'm thinking about. Yeah. And, and, and that's more than it, most of those guys do. But, you know, and I was like, I, and, and my attitude on fan films, um, and I liked yours because it was like, you were doing what you wanted to do. You, your premise wasn't like, okay, so we're on this starship and the captain does this. And yours was like, we're going to do this and this and Q. And, and I'm like, go, go for it, right? Yeah. If there's anything that Vance Major has taught all of us, it's that do whatever the hell you want to do. And and the beauty of what you, you, know, you put down on paper is, man, I'm, I can't do that. I can't do that because I'm stuck with Prelude to Axanar. And and it anything I come out with from now on, if it's not as good as Prelude, I mean, I got shit for Interlude and it wasn't even my film. <laughs> wow. And Interlude's good, right? Yeah. Interlude's good. Yeah. You know, I would dare say Interlude's is, is you know, is is the quality of, you know, that's top of the notch fan film quality that, kind of continuous hit and new voyages hit a couple times and, you know, and renegades, you know, it's that quality. But I, you know, I had people that were like, well, why wasn't it as good as prelude? I go, well, first of all, I didn't do it. I just started it. I mm -hmm. said, you know, and I, but people want it, which is, you know, well, I, I'm not I complaining. It's not, I'm not saying I got a, a cross to bear. Happy to do it. I just can't do what Vance if I said I'm going to take my cell phone and I'm going to go make a Star Trek, then I'm going to put Borg and Q's and Klingons and Klingons married Romulans and they're all playing Warhammer. I'm going to put a v VHS I, on my face and <laughs> I, I couldn't do that because 
people are going to give me shit about that, you know? But you know, you should do it just to troll people. You yeah. should do you. You should just you should just make those kind of films just just for shits and giggles and just to make some people like you know. You just be like, look, I'm not spending any of the crown funny money on, money on this. I'm just doing this because it's fun. You yeah, know, we talked like, about doing Axanar with puppets. Yeah, and there you go. I mean, yeah. you know, and that was that was a thing that got me because spending the time that I have recently in the last few months with people in the, in the fan film community, I've always wanted to do it, but I've just, I never knew where to start. And after spending so much time working with Samuel and Alec and Josh and Vance and Frank, uh, just made me realize, okay, well, there's no one's telling me, no, you can't do it. There's no audition. There's no, like, you know, you have to go through a casting process. It's come up with your story, something that you like, something that's within your wheel, wheelhouse of being able to do and put the pen to paper and start putting it together. And I, I finally said, you know what? These guys are having so much fun. They're having a great time. They're having fun. They're doing something that they like. I'm ready to get in. I need to throw my hat into the ring and, and start doing it as well. And listen, and everyone's here to help each other, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's one of the beauties. It's, it's like whatever, you know, my my studio is always open to everyone, you know. Um, uh, it, it, I I took a lot of pride in the fact that, yeah. After Frank Parker came down for the first time, I guess which was in January, uh, he and I talked about like his bridge that he has in his garage, um, or basement or wherever he has his bridge, which is the really garage. Yeah, it's the garage. Yeah, and it's like pretty damn good for being in your garage. Oh yeah. But I was like. Yeah, Frank, and there were like two things I felt he needed to change. I was like, you got to get rid of this white here. It's got to be black or gray. I they got to get, and then do this with, there was some lighting. I said, blah, 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 blah. And he went back and he did, you know, he did it. And he went and, and did some other things. And because he was like inspired by seeing our bridge and then took some cues from what we did and took it back and, 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 and redid his. And I was like, that's awesome. You know, but we're we're here to help each other. Um, if if there's one thing that we want to all prove, um, and I, I wouldn't even say prove, but we want to live is we want to be in a spot where we're all helping each other. We are the federation. The haters are the Klingons, right? The, we're, we're all we are the federation. Well, wait a minute now. The Klingons have honor. That's true. Let us have honor. Let's the, the packlets. Right? I was just about to say packlets. Yeah, we're we we were right there. Because <laughs> we're starting. Or the Ferengi. Yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, you know. <laughs> no, no, I'd rather hang out with the Ferengi than the haters any day. Ferengi have way more fun and they make more money. That's true. Um, so it's actually you. It's it's funny that you bring up Vance. Um, because you know we we've we we had a great history with with Vance, and I've always said that for me. Vance Major is the uh, the personification of the Federation. You know what I mean? Like he, because when when we first started, we were doing these fan film reactions, and I don't know if you've ever heard of those or anything like that that we've done. But we we watch we would watch fan films blind. We would go in blind, oh, that's and awesome. we would and we would we would talk about them, critique them, say like not from like a standpoint where we're like we know better than you, but we're like we are just fans watching fan films, and we're just like this is what's going. To... So we got to one of Vance's fan films, <laughs> and and we 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 kind of poo pooed all over it, and so and and so you know we 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 were people came after us like like you know they they the man Vance, the Vance is like everyone's big you know a little brother. Like, yeah, oh, my little brother, you know, and, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, Vance, of course, extended the olive branch saying, you know what he's, he said, you know, and everybody was attacking us. And I mean, I was sitting there like me and Zam, the, the, the co-owners of the channel were just like, like, look, this, this is just what we do. Like, you know, we weren't, we weren't too worried about it, but then Vance put out that olive branch and said, Hey, why don't you come on my, I don't remember what program it might've been clinic, uh, critical, not cynical, critical, not company. cynical. Uh, it, but yeah, he, he was, was like, critical, not cynical for a while, then stopped doing it. And then, then I came on and uh, I met him and Frank. We talked about returning back to that. And I came up with the, they told me what their format was then. And I said, okay, well, this is going to be the format that I see it. 
and so we, uh, I changed their format and we've started back up. We've been doing those now for, for a few weeks. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely been back. Um, again. but so when we, we, but he was on there that week with like nine people, I think it was like, jo I think Josh Irwin was on there. I think I know Jonathan Lane was on there because me and him were button heads a lot, <laughs> uh, back then. Um, and just, you know, and, but here's the thing is that Vance was like, he, he, he's a personification like we went at him with 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 just you know the not i don't want to say nastiness but like with klingon ferocity and and he still reached out that hand and said look man i like you guys and he's like i want to work with you guys and we're just like and we were like okay we don't know why but okay we poo pooed <laughs> all over your so that that is like i i love yeah, telling us like about the, vance Go is ahead. like the president of the federation Yes, one hundred percent. If I would write a show that, uh, like, that would be the uh, like the I, I always would I would call it the uh, the birth of the Federation or something like that. Where like you know you have like the early days of the Federation. My president would be Vance Major in that show. Wasn't it on this show that I uh, referred to him as the uh, the fan film ambassador? Yes. Yes. Oh, yep. It was. Yep. Yeah. There. Um. As a matter of fact, I recently had a put in a a, a legal filing against CBS and Paramount. And um, and one of the comments I made was I was just talking about how they don't pay attention to the guidelines. Like no one, they haven't, they haven't, their lawyers don't talk to anyone. They don't care. The guidelines are out there in case anyone gets too good. That's when, right? Because Vance, one of the guidelines is you, can, you can't have sequels. You can only have two episodes and you can't have any prequels or sequels to those two episodes. Well, Vance has done like 150 episodes, you know, uh, with Menard in it. Um, or, or Josh has done 40 minute episodes, or, right? Why, you know, and CBS doesn't care because they're not competing with their Star Trek, right? That, you know, so I said, I called you Vance up and I said, Vance, I'm doing this legal brief. I've got to make the point that CBS doesn't go after fan films because they aren't good enough to, for them to worry. I said, I need to be able to say, that you've done 150 fan films and CBS hasn't gone after you because your films are of low quality. But I'm not going to say that unless you're okay with me saying that in a public legal document because I don't want you to be offended. And I know, and it goes, oh, hell, say it. I, of course they're low quality. <laughs> <laughs> I use an iPhone for God's sakes. Yeah, so he's great, uh, great about it. Um, yeah, when you watch Advanced Major, fan film you're watching something very different than mm -hmm. star trek new voyages or star trek continues or star trek renegades or you know or certainly axnar um and so you 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 have to manage your expectations and and go okay i understand what's what this is all about and that's not for everyone As a matter of fact it's, it's not for most star trek fans but the, the beauty is vance isn't making it for star trek fans he's making it for himself mm -hmm. you know and god yeah. bless and that's why I said to you, Jefferson, I was like, do whatever the hell you want to do. It's for you. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like worrying about make, making a home movie. Well, I don't know if my family's going to like it. Screw it. It's only for your family. It's for your kids. It ain't for your, you know. Yeah. It's like, it's like your audience is so small. Who do you, I, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. Make yourself happy. The only ones who might watch it are your family. So, you know, just go do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and we're here, you know, most of the time we're playing Star Trek, you know, and, and I got to say, it's like when I'm, when I go and play Garth in, in Axnar, I'm not playing Star Trek. It's like, I've got to act. I've got to get into the acting thing and, and which is hard because I'm, I'm not a natural actor and it's hard. And yeah, I'd love to be able to just, you know, go on my iPhone and ham it up as Captain Garth, but I can't, you know, I, you painted you know, yourself in a corner kind of, which I know I did. I know. <laughs> no, I, and that's not a bad thing. That, yeah, that's, I, that's not meant as a negative. It's just, you know, we're going to see more Garth. I, 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 I want to do some Garth stuff with Josh. Oh, that would be great. Uh, yeah. I've, I probably told Josh, I said, I even have an idea for, um, for, a. Uh, uh, a film with uh, Garth and, and and Mason. Oh yeah, see, I love I I love me some Captain Mason. He's he's like one of my favorite captains. 
Oh yeah, he's awesome. He's like he's, he's awesome. like he's like Kirk and Riker, like like blended into like this perfect amalgamation, and I love it. And if you like sprinkle a little Marty McFly in there, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he's. He, He's awesome. Tyler's a great guy. And oh yeah, we love, we have Tyler on here on this program a lot. He does reviews with us sometimes on stuff. So yeah, he's oh. yeah, oh yeah, we 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 love Tyler here. Yeah, he's um, awesome. Tyler's awesome. <clears throat> uh, any any you guys have any other questions or I mean I've got a couple like one or two more. I, I did just want to say real quick thank you Alec and Frank for keeping that encouragement up on the on the premise that I wrote. So that yeah. that definitely does help. Oh yeah, and uh, by the way, in case you, I've got my, I've got little Juno kitten still there. Oh, I think it's a different one. Yeah, love kittens. Uh, no, this is Juno. Yeah, this is Juno. What's up, Juno? Yeah, <laughs> Juno just loves. Uh, yeah, now, now he's biting me. Okay, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> he, uh, we just adopted out his, um, her, her brother Sparky, who is just an amazing little cat. We just loved him, but oh my God, was that little cat a fart machine? <laughs> he would come up in the bed and fart in my face and both I'd be like roll out of our bed just reaching for the gas masks I mean yeah, that's, that, that's a cat for you I mean <laughs> <laughs> no fucks I'm oh, sorry that's okay that's I, all right. it's, it's my not a family show program. <laughs> there are um, no children watching the show and if you are where are your parents yeah right <laughs> seriously like, yeah talk to you everybody. Um, so I, I, I'm a, I'm a big starship guy and I, and the, one of, one of my biggest, one of my biggest things is that, especially with TOS era, uh, uh, like anything is everybody loves that Connie class. I know that Frank Parker Jr. has done it. And I love his dreadnought, like his, uh, I can't remember the actual class, but the dreadnought class that he has in there, but I, I'm not a class dreadnought, which one? Is it the Federation class dreadnought, the one from uh, Franz Franz Joseph? I it, it's the one with the three nacelles and yeah. and yeah. Well, there's um, yeah because there's it, also an upgrade version of that. But. So, I, I I but I'm not a huge Connie class fan. I I feel like I'm so I'm unfortunately like the Connie class I just never liked. That's like the bread and butter of Star Trek. Exactly, but that's okay, so why one like, and Enterprise is your second favorite Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Two. You don't even like the Constitution class. Mm -mm. What are you about to tell us next? <laughs> Where's the other shoe? <laughs> that the Enterprise B is my favorite <laughs> Enterprise. Anyway, oh, yeah, uh, I love. I, I love. Well, the the Enterprise. That's the Excelsior uh, that, class. Yeah, I love the Excelsior class. I don't like the Enterprise B, um, and it's funny because I talked to John Eves about the Enterprise B, and and I said, you know, John, I I mean the Enterprise E is just my favorite enterprise. Right? Oh, I love the enterprise E as well. E. It's amazing. And I told John Eves, I was like, John, I love the E. I said, but I got to be honest with you. I said, the B looks like, sh it looks like you just bolted shit on. I said, the front of the, and where the deflector dishes is just an abortion. I, I What the hell is that? And he's like, Alec, they just told me they didn't want it to look like the Excelsior. They needed additional stuff. I was like, all right, I, I guess you got your marching orders. Yeah, you the know? Enterprise B is an Excelsior class. They just didn't yeah, want and it that, to look like I, the Excelsior. I love the Excelsior class. Like, that's one of my favorite ships. Oh, yeah, like, the, yeah. the original, you know, NCC 2000, I love. I love mm -hmm. that design. and Because the first time you see it in Star Trek 3. 3, yeah. Right, 3. Mm -hmm. when The first time you see it, you're like, yeah. Yeah, that's the next one. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes total. It's like when you see the Star Trek Three Phaser. You see the Star Trek Three Phaser, and you go, "Yeah, that's not that Star Trek One Two piece of shit. That Star <laughs> Trek Three Phaser is exactly what should have been the next Phaser after the TOS Phaser, right?" Yeah, it made total sense. The Excelsior was the same thing. It was like you saw Excelsior, you said, "Yes, that's the future," right? Mm -hmm. And which bears out because they're still using it eighty years later in Deep Space Nine. I always, I always wanted them to to go back in when they re like if they ever remaster the Dominion War. I would love, I, I love the Excelsior class and I love the Miranda. Well, I like the Miranda class, but like, I would just want them to kind of redo the CG and just update the ships. Like, you know, I you really shouldn't have you. you I mean, yeah. I would have like for seen, them. 
have you seen the 4K version of the um, the battle from Sacrifice of Angels? Yeah, but they're still using the Mirandas and the Excelsiors in that. You know, oh, like, right. Why right. aren't they using? Yeah, and why aren't they using any Constitution uh, Constitution upgrades? Why did we never see a Constitution upgrade in all of Star Trek: Deep Space Nine? All those space battles, we saw all these Reliant classes, the Miranda classes, and we never saw a Constitution class. Why not? I, that, that that's what I'm saying. Like I, if they went back, I would love for them to update for more. Like I know that they were there, but they weren't prominent. Like like replace all the Mirandas with like a Karin class, and replace you know all the Galaxies with Sovereign classes, and the Excelsiors with like Steamrunner classes, or so, you know some other like you know like some of these you know yeah. I, you, yeah. you know especially in the wartime because I feel like that's what those ships were built for. They were built to battle the Borg. So going back to my original, though, is that since I'm not really a fan of the Connie class, I love Prelude to Axanar and watching all of those pre-Connie class ships getting highlighted. And then the Ares class, or not, the, yeah, the Ares class. I'm like, the Ares, I'm like, oh, I love this ship. I'm like, oh. yeah, you <laughs> It's know, a nice that, looking ship. It is a nice looking ship. It was, um, yeah, and I knew what that ship was going to look like. Um, I have, as a matter of fact, I, I did a piece on it. I, I need to do another video on it, outlining how we came out with, with, with the Aries. Um, but I had collected a bunch of uh, photographs of different ships, different people had done online, you know, um, and they all had low, lower nacelles. And, um, and there was, there was one especially that I had that was really close. And, um, and so that's kind of what we based it off of. I, I kind of knew what I wanted, but we came up with Ares class first. And then I was like, okay, well, what are the other ships? And I really, I, we kind of started with, um, uh, as, as you know, it's pretty obvious. We started with the ships from Star Trek 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and we started, and I said to Tobias Richter, who was our VFX guy at, at the time, I said, Tobias, we need to take these ships and use these designs, but make them in our, in our aesthetic, you know, and these are all the ships that Starfleet, you know, is producing at the beginning of the war. Right. Um, so, so we did, and I think it really, it, it came out great. I, I mean, our fleet came out great. It was, what, what are you guys doing? They're messing with my Warhammer books. You're trying to pick a good book to read or something. Look yeah, at him. That's Kiki over there. That's <laughs> Juno's sister. So uh, getting into yeah. trouble. Kiki says for the trouble. So yeah, so I think I think we um I think we found a good but I'm a, a matter of fact if I if I move out of the way, uh, all my down over there are all my technical manuals. Like I have all, all of those there are Star Trek technical manuals. Wow so on the second shelf. Like, you know, everyone, all the chronologies. I have the original space flight chronology, the next gen chronology, and all the, you know, all the fan produced technical manuals. I got all that stuff. So, yeah, I'm like you. I'm a total geek about that stuff. So, um, but I wanted to make sure, um, I wanted to make sure that all of that stuff, <laughs> all of that stuff worked right in our, in our universe. But that everything made sense and the timelines made sense and events made sense. I mean, um, even when in the next two episodes, you know, where the Klingon reinforcements come, they come from a system that we know the Klingons invaded. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so it, it was really important to have all that because I, as I, as I always said, when, we, whenever we did con um, conventions and, presented prelude to you know hundreds of, uh, of fans i said you you're welcome to ask me all those questions but just know you can't out geek me it's like i guarantee you every little thing you see in this has a reason um, and i've thought the reasons through because i want to be able to give you the, the the answer you want you know when you, you when you see something yeah, I want you to be able to say, "Oh, well, that makes sense in my canon, right?" You know, and ho and hopefully, uh, you you see Axonar as part of your your head canon, right? Um, that that's important to me. I, 
I think one of the best comments I had from anyone was someone said to me, you know, Alec, 50 years from now, no one's going to know that Prelude to Axnor is not official studio canon. I was like, oh, hmm, that's pretty impressive. I'm like, yeah, uh, that's cool. So hopefully the next two episodes are, are of equal, you know, people consider are of equal stature uh, to that. Um, and uh, and once again, there's a whole team of talented people that work that work on Axonar. You know, it's uh, uh, we got uh, the look of Prelude to Axonar was due to was due, sorry uh, was due to our uh, DP Milton Santiago, and um, uh, you know we had great actors, great makeup, great crew. Yeah, you know the crews often don't get you know credit. The gaffers and 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 grips and all those people but you know everyone we've been very fortunate and the last four shoots we're about to do our fifth and final shoot next month the last four shoots have um been the same exact crew we've had the same crew for the most part you know i would say 75 percent of the people are exactly the same on each one of the shoots you know same director same co-director same uh editor same gaffer same dp same a key grip um we've been lucky that way uh because we finally settled on a group of people who all believed in the project as paramount whereas i think beforehand we often had certainly directors who were more worried about what the project meant to them than the project itself you know axnor um i, I always say axnor alec peters is not axnor Alec Peters created Axnor, wrote it, have, has a role in it, um, but it's just a ton of great people that make Axnor successful. Um, and uh, and Kiki, here's Kiki. That's Juno's sister, who's bigger. What's up, buddy? All right, uh, Mage Jefferson, do you guys have any other questions? Uh, no other questions for me that I can think of. I will think of questions after we're all done. Yeah, you know, right. On. You, know, you know how that is. It, we'll do know. another episode. You guys come on our come, come on Axar Confidential one night. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah that'd be to. a lot of fun. We'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about Star Trek in general. Yeah. And I mean, if you ever want to come back on, you know, this pro as this is just a weekly podcast while while there's no Star Trek, you know, active new episodes of Star Trek in the work. In the mm -hmm. work. You know, well, premiering you know because we normally on thursdays would do star trek reviews of whatever star trek comes out that week oh okay and so that's why we started this podcast and we're just like well there's no track so we might as well just talk about star trek well and also someone asked earlier um uh that uh if you haven't heard axel hope knockwood is going to be out this summer okay um, uh, that was going to be one of my last th questions was yeah um it's next month is our final shoot. The final two actors get shot next month, um, which I'm so excited about. Um, we've got two amazing, amazing actors uh, coming in, um, both of whom you know. I, I'm excited for Bill Shatner to be in your film. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> my, my talk, smile, about a, talk about a coup de grace there. Yeah, right. <laughs> I did, I, you know, we had said something at one point like, wouldn't it be great to have, you know, Kirk in his old age recounting something about his hero, you know, yeah. which was, was regard. Um, yeah, I'd still, uh, you know, love to do that. Um, maybe we should approach him now since Paramount kicked him to the curb. Um, if, if there's any time, it would be now. Right. Mm -hmm. We say, hey, what are, how mad would CBS and Paramount be at that point? Oh God! They would. They, oh, they yeah. Maybe you, you think it came up before. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will. They will send the, the the yeah. They will send the villagers with the uh, with, with the the tiki torches to burn us down. Well, yeah, um, but they would all be paid villagers because you know yeah. nobody really. See, that's the thing is that with with Trek people, we'll like, send the Trek brood people squad. like us, I'm on the brood squad. 
like yeah with with trekkies like us we want good fan films because for years that's all we had was fan films Mm -hmm. so you know at the break between enterprise and discovery was brutal for a lot of us who just didn't have trek you know, like I that that was one of my mainstays growing up was Star Trek. I I I would love to have a Star Trek too. Yeah, I, I mean, all I had was seventy nine episodes, right? You know, with I I was born in nineteen sixty. I I watched Star Trek for I watched the Man Trap when it premiered on 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 CB on NBC. Um, uh, I you know I grew up in New York where a lot of us. It's so it's always amazing how many people spent time in New York metro area in the 70s and watched star trek every night at six o'clock i mean doug drexler uh richard hatch who who, who is it i mean I, so many people i talked to like oh yeah i watched on channel 11 wpix at six o'clock every night um so yeah so we're we're with you there uh the, 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 there's a lot of, so yeah so listen uh, um we're we're excited we and as i told before we offered axonar to CBS during the lawsuit. Um, one of our big donors was friends with the general counsel, Jonathan Anshell, of, of CBS. And they were drinking scotch and smoking cigars one night. And 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 my guy said, why don't you just take Axnor? He'll give it to you. And he goes, What do you well, we're not gonna pay for it? And he goes, No, he doesn't want any money, he'll give it to you. Just take it and put it on your website or something. And he just couldn't understand that we didn't want money for it. Like, yeah, they, they like don't I'm understand that we just want good track. Yeah. yeah. Listen, and, and this is, uh, this is something we're hoping to, to trailblaze with the Orville. Cause we're going to do an Orville fan film. Ooh. And, and uh, we are, um, and we, we have support at the highest levels of uh of the orville um and i can't say more but i'm hoping that we create what should have happened 10 years ago what should have happened is cbs and paramount should have said okay look this is too good which is what they said multiple times they told us that it was too good that's not why they were suing us this is too good you give it to us you go make it raise your money you make it you give me it to us and we're going to monetize it. We're going to, we're going to make Blu-rays and we're going to put it on our, and you're not getting a penny. And I would have been fine. Take it, go, we'll make more. And they could have created an entirely new way for Hollywood to fund new content, right? That it would have been a, just, they could have trailblazed a new, but remember. A big economy of entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. But, one of the lessons I learned in Hollywood was no one ever lost their job saying no. Right. Mm -hmm. No. And, right. And there's Interesting. no, and, and if you're looking at trailblazers, they're all up in Silicon Valley. They're not in Hollywood. Look at the shit we're getting out of Hollywood these days. It's all regurgitating things we've seen already. Right. Yep. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 you hear this all the time. There's nothing new. They're just, re, you know, no one's true. Um, so, um, yeah, but maybe with the Orville, we can, you know, listen, the Orville is not going to, it's not, if they got the green light tomorrow, the Orville wouldn't be on Hulu for two years. Oh, yeah, no. I, I That's my big problem right now is that, yeah, is that you're right. It would take them so long to bring out Orville after they green light season four that it would, it would, it would feel like an eternity. Yeah, so we want to fill it in. Um, you know, we're we're gonna go back in time and show you the beginning of the planetary union, and um, we'll, we'll see what. But I'm hoping not just to do that and to have fun doing that, but to maybe you know, maybe there there's still a way to to do something different in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe we can do something that that uh, you know that fuzzy door goes. Oh wow. Yeah, what if we promoted these guys on our website? Heaven, heaven forbid, right? Yeah. You know, someone take it. But um, and I, you know, they're wonderful people. I mean, Seth's organization is everyone. I've only met a couple, um, and not met, you know, been introduced to a couple. Um, 
my partner in the operation knows everyone and uh, they're just great, great, great people. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we can do something interesting and unique and sad. I mean, we're all I, it's so funny. We're all Orville fans on, on this side uh-huh. of it. And so uh, we'd love, we'd love to do it, but. Uh, well, and so, that's the thing is that Seth MacFarlane was a Star Trek fan. Right. Did yeah. you see his fan film? Yeah. Yeah, he was on Enterprise. Like he's, like that's what I'm saying. Like like that he gets you because he's like I, I'm sure. I mean I don't know if it's Seth himself, but he's like he is a Star Trek fan. He what he wanted Orville to be Star Trek, and it just like yeah, Paramount and CBS are shooting themselves in the foot with all of this. Like oh god, it just frustrates me to no end. And don't get me wrong, I think we're getting some good Trek nowadays. Like I love Lower Decks and Strange New Worlds. Oh yeah, in the, in the latter half of Discovery. And some parts of Picard. I've started Prodigy. Prodigy Prodigy was a bit of a miss for me, but I, I'm not I'm not one of those that say it's not Trek. No, it's Trek. It's just not my Trek. You know yeah, what I mean? And like, that's good, right? And that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I have no problem with that. I'm not going to sit there and say it's not Trek. It's just not for me, Trek. You know, just right. like if somebody doesn't like you know Axanar or whatever, it, it's it's not their kind of. But you know what? Don't sit there and say, oh, it's not Trek. I hate it when people say that. I know. See, I'm not a big fan of Lower Decks, but I I don't go around spewing hate about it. I'm right. just. It, but it he just does feel hate right. about the fact that I like Enterprise. <laughs> yeah, I just I, I still can't. <laughs> not that Enterprise was bad. Don't get me wrong, but second favorite. Yeah, listen, you, you you're in the wrong crowd. Me me and Mage, we are we are big Enterprise fans. Actually, we I I took Zam toe to toe in a debate defending Enterprise. Yeah, <laughs> he, 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 well, he shifted, the, he shifted not... the topic on everything. Listen, I could see. Listen, I could see that. Look, it's kind of hard. Typically, when you talk favorite Star Treks, it's kind of hard to to separate out TOS, right? Because so many of us, like so, like Jefferson, you're probably were raised on TNG. I was raised on TOS, yep. so you're always going to have a special place in your heart for what you were raised on, right? Mm-hmm. But if you really think about, like, okay, what's truly my favorite Star Trek? Look. By a mile, it's Deep Space Nine. If I'm going to be on a desert island with one Star Trek series, it's de- it's Deep Space Nine. There's mm-hmm. no second. Mm-hmm. And and before all the new Star Treks, if you this, what would be my second? Wow, that would be tough. I don't know what my second would be. Um, and, but it wouldn't be Voyager. <laughs> no, like it. Not okay. that it's bad. it would be Voyager because I just felt like Voyager was too much like Next Generation. It was Zam uh, loves Voyager. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I like it. It's 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 good, but it's just too much like Next Gen. And Next Gen had those first two seasons that were just horrendous and are basically unwatchable. You know, and, and so it wouldn't be Next Gen. I'm I'm just not a Next Gen guy. No, which neither am I. Me, which would leave me with four seasons of, T- of Enterprise or three seasons of TOS. And it's like, huh. Yeah, that's honestly, that's, a, you know, that's probably a, you know, a tough call. Pro- a, a, probably be TOS, but I could easily see someone saying Enterprise. I, I could certainly see that. So I don't think that's, a you know, I don't think it's that far out of the realm of possibility. The I, problem I, with Voyager is that Voyager is what uh, was supposed to be what we got in Battlestar Galactica 2004. It was supposed to be more of a uh, out, outlaws trying to get home, limited resources, et cetera, et cetera. But <clears throat> Rick Berman, Brandon Braga, they hated, <clears throat> they hated DS9 so much and the serialized storytelling that they went in guns blazing on Voyager to make it episodic. We want to get to syndication. Syndication was all they cared about. Um, <clears throat> so, and it was it was the whole money thing. And that's why Voyager's premise went from something that is just made to be serialized to becoming villain of the week episodes was because they, they wanted to have a ship lost in space, but they were so much against serialized storytelling because they wanted the syndication money. That's why Voyager became what it was. Yeah, and it's again not bad. It's just not, you know. Yeah, there were you know some episodes I loved, and 
We're out in the middle of nowhere. We have unlimited shuttles, torpedoes. Well, my my thing was actually my Voyager for me had the opposite had the opposite mindset of DS9 is the fact that DS9 had so many characters and they focused on all those characters. Like Nog got an episode, Lita got an episode, you know, or Nog got several episodes. You know, Voyager focused on three characters and everybody else kind of got pushed to the background. You know what I mean? Like it was mm -hmm. like Janeway, Seven, and the doctor. Tom Paris? The other no, doctor. the doctor. Yeah, the like, doctor. he was the third one. Balana mm -hmm. and Tom had their moments, but, you know, like, but DS9 had, like, that op the opposite of Voyager effect, where it's like, yeah, DS9, like, you had side characters of side characters getting major story arcs that were amazing. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. As a matter of fact, uh, where's, let's see. Little. I haven't seen any of them back there. <laughs> they might have abandoned you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, nice. You know what this the, is? The, uh, the torpedo, yeah. No, no, that's oh. a phaser coil from the Defiant. Oh, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the burned out phaser coil. That's what I meant. Like the one that that's, they, uh, the one that they one. kept on mounting on the walls. That's, now I have to ask you this, Alec. Why do you okay. have that? I'll show you the one other thing I. Have. I just thought it was a torpedo for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> I because I collect Star Trek props and costumes. Okay, not, not yeah. so much anymore, but I, I kept the good ones. <gasps> Is that the Grand Nagus staff? Is it? No, it's not the Grand Nagus staff. That's Nog's cane. Oh yeah, oh. yeah. When he lost his leg in a yeah. AR five five eight. Yep. Exactly. Actually, you know, Nog is Nog is my favorite DS nine character. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, the dad, the Daedalus. I can't really pronounce it. But. The, the the no, I thought was it the Dauntlet? No, not the no, Dauntlet. That's the that's technically the Horizon. That's the model from Cisco's office. Mm -hmm. Nice. This, oh, this is, this is actually Cisco's computer. Oh, oh nice. Brother, one of my one of my pride and joys. And then and then here I'll also show you. And then uh, we see we could do a whole stream on just all the props in your yeah. room. Yeah, really. If you remember the episode where Cisco makes the clock, yep. yeah, 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 and then, uh, and, oh, and then. Uh, oh, yes, uh, <laughs> genius or Oregon. So, anyway, yes, let's just, take uh, a trip to Rise. But that's uh, that's well, there's you know. there's the sex toy right there, <laughs> yeah, there's the sex toy. <laughs> 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 oh, cultural sex toy. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I'm going to have to hold a Warhammer figure and, and my Horcon. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> or else I'm okay, just, just going to do a graphic with the Horgon and a Warhammer figure, and I'm not going to say anything. And that's going to be our logo. For <laughs> you should you know if you ever do one of those trolling videos, you should just always have one of those objects in your hand in every scene. Like, <laughs> no, from shot to shot, it changes. And yeah, so like yeah. intentional continuity error. It just change which one he's holding. Listen, after listen after you you release all of Axanar, I'm telling you, you should just go buck wild and just be like, you know what, I Axanar, here, here's my standard right here. But you know what, I'm just having fun. So here's here's all this stuff that I'm just gonna do for fun and like just watch people lose their mind. I would love <laughs> it. just the inverse. It's Renaxaw, Renaxa. <laughs> People's heads would explode. I, you know, I, it just it, it, bo it boggles my mind why people just you know just just get so upset about this stuff. Where it's like, just have fun. It's Trek, you know. Like, I, you know, don't the only get thing upset I about get... having to pay taxes. Yeah, yeah. Get, get upset about having to wait in line at McDonald's for fifteen minutes. I, I only <laughs> get mad at people when they when they keep on asking, "When did Trek get woke?" Oh God, I, I hate that word has been so overused. I hate hearing it now. I know, but still, like it's still the it's still the question. It's just like Yeah, it's the question is like, okay, you're telling me how stupid you are. Yeah, right. Like you're do you watch Star Trek? Stupid. It always you watch Star Trek? It always has been. It was yeah. always woke. Yeah. I mean, yeah. by the definition of woke, I'm like, you know, right. and, and I agree the, the word is overused, yep. you know, but it's just like, yes. yeah, Trek has always been progressive. You know, well, mm -hmm. let's use progressive. Always. You know, yeah. like, yeah, I, so. I, I mean, because the technical definition of woke is sensitive to the uh, was it sensitive to the inequalities in society, something like that. Yeah, that's Star Trek. Yeah, right. 
right? <laughs> so, it's it's baked in TOS. I mean, you you look at the bridge. Gene Roddenberry made that bridge crew because he wanted to show all of like all, all the different nationalities of the world. Well, it, as much as possible, working together in one space. As equals. And, yes. And, you know, he chose very specific that, ones to that moment in time, though. Yeah, it's Mage. Like, yeah. Yeah, you're like, exactly Chekhov right. Chekhov is Russian for a reason. Yes. Mm -hmm. And ask those same people, what part of Let That Be Your Last Battlefield were you not paying attention yeah, I know, to? Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what did you think that was about? Yeah. Duh. And the, my favorite meme of which i i should i'm sure i have it somewhere on my computer is is someone took a black and white cookie they took two black and white cookies and just turned one in and said which one do you want you know <laughs> <laughs> i want the one with the uh, the chocolate on the right and the vanilla yeah, on the left <laughs> oh my goodness. So I, but but the the, the the interesting thing i'll, I'll bring it back to axonar is um after I had written Axanar, I had to go back and rewrite the characters um, because they weren't diverse enough. And I was like, mm -hmm. look at this. I wrote this script and I wrote this crew and they were basically, I had always had, Tanaka was always the first officer. So he had that. But I was like, yeah, I need to make this crew more diverse. And I, And then when we were casting, I had to really pay attention to it then as well. Um, not for any, not because I'm tied to some artificial quota. No, it's for exactly what Mage said. It's it's that you you have to pay attention to where you are. And like, so I don't have a Chinese person on the bridge, but, you know, there would be one in the crew just like there would be an, you know, we and we do have an Indian in 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 the next two episodes. We have, you know, um, well, I'm sure they don't. We don't expect the United Nations to be on the bridge. Yeah, no, yeah, and it's not. Yeah, it's not going to be. But you want some diversity. You don't want mm -hmm. everyone. To be I just I want to know where the Andorian officers are. I want Andorian justice. Okay, there were like no Federation Andorians in TOS. There were Andorians, not We've Andorian. Got two in our next two episodes, <laughs> the head of Starfleet and uh, one of the captains. Nice. I I love Andorians. I I just I love every. You're, you're gonna love it because the head of Starfleet has old style TOS and Andorian antenna. Ooh. And the captain has Enterprise style TOS and Oh, okay. yeah, Shran is one of my favorites from Enterprise. I love. I mm -hmm. that that's one of the main reasons why I love Enterprise is the Andorians too. I just love. Oh, man, I and love I, and I got to meet Jeffrey Combs and have lunch with him. No oh. way! Oh man, oh. that is awesome. We talked about. I wanted him to play uh, Moreau. Tran? Moreau. I wanted oh, him to man. play the the old Klingon, um, who was Karn's mentor, and uh, the last. Thought Admiral, as he's uh, 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 referred to, and um, and he didn't want, he just didn't want to play a Klingon. It was, it was really interesting. He was like, yeah, I just, uh, I just. Did you, you know, offer him the TOS version where he doesn't have to wear the ridges? Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, but of course, and of course, you get. Hopefully, you got the Shran reference in Prelude to Axanar. I did. I, yes. I appreciated yep. that. I'm mm -hmm. very great. I yeah, appreciated how much homage you paid to Enterprise and how much you acknowledged that it is a part of the history of Trek and that what it laid down is lore. Yeah, because the same stuff we're dealing with right now with people saying, you know, Strange New Worlds, not my Trek. Discovery, not my Trek. That was Enterprise. Like, you know, like that was Enterprise back, that you was, know, that back was in TNG when it first came out. That was it's, TNG when it first yeah. came out. Yeah, it's, yes, yes, it was. I, I'll tell you, you know, I, and I'll tell you a story about, um, because there's, the, the, Saval's my favorite character in Prelude, um, because Gary just hit it out of the park. He was, he was just freaking brilliant. Um, but I, it was my favorite character to write for. Um, and with Gary, um, I made him watch. I sent him the clip <clears throat> of, uh, I, I told him, I said, look, Gary, I said, we were talking about his character in, in Prelude. And I said, your character, your Saval in Prelude now 
you know, he's he's 80 years older than he was in Enterprise, right? He's at the end of his career, and he's retiring. You know, this is this is it. But he he's hanging on for the, for the war. Um, and I said, remember where Savals came in in Enterprise. His arc in Enterprise is the biggest growth arc in in that in that series. And I and I sent him the clip of of uh, when uh, Vaughn Armstrong, who's that Admiral Forrest, right? Admiral yep. Forrest mm-hmm. passed when, say, when, he, he, when he saved Saval's life. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so remember, I said, you got to watch this because this is th- this tells you uh, where, how far Saval has come, and where he says that you know basically Vulcans are scared of humans. Um, <laughs> and so he got it and he, he, he got it and, and he brought that to, to prelude. So, um, the scene where he says, um, an Endorian acquaintance of mine once said, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, don't push the pink skins to the thin ice. That was like, I got to tell you. I could I could write screenplays for the next fifty years of my life, and I'll never come up with a line as great as that one in my in my book. I, dude, I I got chills when I heard that. I, I remember when I first watched because I, I watched Prelude years ago when it first came out. Like I knew of Prelude for for a long time. I just hadn't I I was not a part of the fan film community like I am now until like the past two years. So, but I had seen Prelude all those times, and when I first heard that line, I got chills, and I'm like. Oh my God, this guy loves Enterprise. Like that was my first thought. Like he 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 gets oh, it. I'm glad. Yeah. So I, I'm glad. You, that's great that that you take that away because you should. And when we were shooting that scene, like Gary wasn't connecting with the line. And what I realized was I was watching it right. So I'm off camera. What I realize is he doesn't realize who the the Andorian acquaintance is. So I went up to Christian Gossett because as producer, I don't talk to, the, I generally don't talk to the talent, right? To the actors. Let the director do that. So I pulled Christian aside and I said, I said, tell him that the Andorian acquaintance is Shran. And I'm sure Christian didn't even know who Shran was, but so he walks over to, to Gary and says, Gary, the Vulcan acquaintance the Andorian acquaintance is Shran. And Gary turns to me and goes, <laughs> <laughs> the next, the, and so the next take is what you see in Prelude. Yeah. He nailed it. Just Brilliant. nailed it. He's so damn good. He's oh, so well, damn good. He is. And, oh, yeah. And and, and, and so I, I have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things I have nothing to do with that are on camera, but that one I have a lot to do with and I'm very proud of it. Well, and I think if there's, if there's anything that really sets the tone on, on this, on the, uh, the prelude to Axon arm and the four years war is that line, that line holds so mm-hmm. much because you just don't fuck with the humans. In yeah, right. They'll leave you alone. Generally, you know, they'll leave you alone, but if you push them, then you're in a, for a world uh, full of hurt. And, you know, I was thinking about that line uh, several times. I'd recently got into a lot of World War World War II shows and movies, uh, just getting into the, well, you know, the history of it and all, you know, all the movies. And tell me if I'm wrong, I'm not a huge history buff, but what I've always understood from it was that America didn't want to have any part of the war. They were staying out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they weren't being touched, and the the Axis allies were pretty much leave America alone. We're okay, leave them alone. And Japan went and did like, wait, you did what? Yeah. And so that that just that turned it right there. If, if Japan hadn't screwed around and ticked off the U.S., mm-hmm. we might be speaking German right. and Japanese yeah. right now. But right, and you know and they it, made them and, angry. Yeah, right, and so the that whole. I'm sorry. What did you say, Mage? Oh, I was just observing the FDR baited the Japanese by messing with their oil. With uh, their oil, yeah, yeah. Listen, it was in that people. If you you know when you look into the history, it was obvious ten years earlier that the U.S. and Japan were going to go to war. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but um, that whole line, don't push the pink skins to the thin ice, is is in a way comes from what Yama, uh, from what Admiral Yamamoto said after they bombed Pearl Harbor, which he's because Yamamoto did not want to go to war with the U.S. He was educated, I think, at Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, right? He knew he knew all about the United States. He had enormous respect for the United States. He Yamamoto was brilliant. He did not want Japan to go to war with the United States. And um, there's some great movies about it. Um, the Great War of Archimedes, if you if uh, which is one of my favorite, which I have. Let me. Doo -doo -doo -doo. If you can get this, this, this is one of the best war movies you'll see. Uh, it's all about the the bat the battle to build the Yamamoto the, the Yamato the the battleship Yamato and its sister ship Musashi. But anyway, um, Yamamoto didn't want to go to war with the United States, and he, it's the army that pushed them into war. But anyway, once they did, you know, like a good soldier, he was like, well, if we're going to war, I'm going to make sure we do our best, and. Um, after Pearl Harbor, he he said um, his very famous quote was, um, "I I fear we have wakened a sleeping giant and filled it with a terrible resolve." And that's what that's kind of like the the same sentiment that that um, that Saval is getting to there with "Don't push the pink skins into thin ice" because I really saw the Federation. And the United States, I, I see a lot of parallels. Where the Federation was at that point in time is a lot like where the United States was at that point in time in World War II. We were still young. We were still, you know, World War I, yeah, whatever. We were still a young power. Um, and we had not come into our own. And we were not, you know, we were on the other side of the world from both Japan and from Europe. And, and, and so if you understand... The, the 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 geopolitics of the time, um, World War II made the United States what it is today, and that's kind of what I'm getting at in Prelude to Action or in, in the Four Years' War. The Four Years' War kind of made the Federation what it what it became, what you right. see in Kirk's time. Um, it, it, you know, there's all those parallels. So, you, you... yeah. Well, and one of the things just uh, roping it back to to Axanar and that line about the pink skins was uh, it, it it took me back also to a the quote from Quark in DS9 when he's talking. I don't remember who he's talking to. I think it's Garrick, actually. Garrick, way the warrior. Yeah. When he says, you know what, you know, when when the Feder, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but when the Federation, when their 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 cots are warm and their bellies are full, they're fine. But when you take all that, those amenities, an, I can't even amenities. say that amenities away from them, they are they are just as ruthless and cutthroat as and you know and you know and just look at their history. But I mean, like that that's a quote that also sticks out to me about from Quark is because until that quote in Deep Space Nine, I you know I, I never thought of the Federation that way. But then you look at it, like look at look at the Dominion War, look at the you know you know look at that kind of stuff. You know, it's just well, like, the, the, and the great the other great quote that he he says to Garrick is in the way of the warrior when they're drinking and he gives Garrick clubs uh, root beer for the first time. Right? Oh and yes, yes, I yes. I, that, Cheeto was going with that at the begin with was the, the no, no, no. And you're right that analogy. there's that quote too. But I just love that that the other quote that I was talking. But no, the root beer one is also a great quote. Yes, oh, the, yeah, good. that that that's great. Yeah, yeah, because it tells you, yeah, because it tells you that's very insightful about the Federation as well. Like and the people, you know that that it, it's in it, it's it, he calls of course Garrett calls it insidious, um, but the Federation is is enlightenment, right? The Federation is trying to bring enlightenment um, uh, to to people, and uh, people get used to that, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get it just like you get used to the amenities, and it's, as, you know I I think that's important. But I, I, you know, so I, you can't help but see the parallels between the Federation and the United States, um, or the Feder, and not that the United States is perfect. Let's let's just be honest; we've made our share of mistakes. Um, but I think the aspirations for what um, uh, 
some of us want the United States to be. We do mm -hmm. want to be globalists. We don't want to be um, uh, isolationists, right? We want to lead the world, and and the Federation wants to lead lead the you know the all the worlds uh, of the Federation to uh, to prosperity and enlightenment and uh, you know all these things. I think. Um, uh, Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry wrote about because he was a utopian. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, yeah. he certainly believes a lot more in the, in humanity than many of us do right now. I, I've yeah. said that a lot. I've said, yeah, Gene Roddenberry, like he, he had lofty dreams for the human race. I mean, you know, I, I, unfortunately with his passing in 91, you know, I, I, but he was, he was, what was he in the seventies at that point? I mean, you know, so, but still, I mean, like he wouldn't have, Pro he would have probably, probably not have been alive at this point anyway, even if he lived lived a full life. Yeah. Uh, but still, but you know, like, uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, the outlook on the human race is not that great. I'm, I'm very pessimistic about the future of the human race. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we kind of look at it like, oh, we want to be Star Trek. Yeah, we're probably leaning more towards Babylon Five. Or, <laughs> well, Dune. Or, yeah, I mean, the Expanse. Dune. We're right you know, on like, track for the Bell Riots. They're due any day now. <laughs> yeah, right. We're waiting for those Bell Riots. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Unfortunately, we can see the we. We can see the worst parts of the Federation, uh, you know, future coming, coming about. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, with that, I think that's a great place to stop it. Um, I, again, thank you so much, Alec, for being here. Oh yeah, thank you guys. Had, had, a, had a ton of fun. Also, uh, Mage and Jefferson, thank you so much for being here. I, I do, Jefferson. You're the one who told Alec to reach out to us. So yes. I mean. Like, I do greatly appreciate you. Uh, uh, I do greatly appreciate you doing that for us, and I, it is a wonderful time. I want to do this again. Yeah, yeah. Let's, and we'll do it on my channel. Huh? We'll yeah, absolutely. As I said, I mean, we we can come over there and we can do we can do discussions too. I love talking Trek all I'd the time. To, I'd love to hear more. Of, I'd love to hear about what it was like working with JG next time we talk. Oh, happy to. We'll do I'm that. Yeah, to. I'm game. All right, I gotta go walk the dogs. All right, all guys. Right. Well, with that all That's being said, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Um, live long and prosper, and we will catch you guys in the next one. This is NerdTube, the greatest YouTube channel you've kind of maybe sort of heard of. We'll see you later.